Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now we are going to have the event five, Japan US security relationship after March 11th. Uh, this uh, panel discussion is, uh, of course, uh, uh, hosted by USJI and also co hosted by Waseda University Organization, one who are Japan US studies, gorgeous. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today for uh, this panel discussion on the present and the future of the US-Japan alliance. Uh, our countries, uh, Japan and the United States, are a critical juncture, uh, not least because the presidential election is due later this year in the United States. Uh, the tasks for the U.S.-Japan alliance to tackle are to make the alliance more robust and operationally ready, uh, technologically more advanced, and politically more reliable from our Indo-Pacific Indo partners, all in this age of mounting debt and tremendous uh, austerity. With the spread of democracy, across the region on one hand, and the Beijing Authority showing even more eagerness to build its military arsenal. And on the other hand, in preparation for the uh, Communist Party's centennial anniversary, uh, nine years from now, uh, never before has the alliance gained uh, such uh, salience as now. I should say that the stronger and the more reliable our alliance, the more stable the entire region will be from South to East uh, Asia and from Canberra to Seoul and Tokyo. How best to tie even more firmly with pure maritime democracies in the region and elsewhere, in my view, needs a vigorous uh, debate. With that, and with no further ado, uh, let us now hear what the members of the panel have to say. We have a distinguished panel of three speakers. Uh, I'd like to introduce, first of all, uh, Mr. James uh, Zumwalt as the first speaker. James Zumwalt is currently Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Japan and uh, Korea at the State Department. He spent the final months of his later, uh, latest tour in Japan with his beloved and very talented uh, wife, uh, Anne Kambara, helping relieve the pain of those affected by the uh, quake, tsunami, and radiation, uh, what is now called a triple disaster. Uh, by shuttering between Tokyo and the disaster stricken, stricken area of Northeast uh, Japan. The ambassador, Jim, served so well. John Roos also much, uh, made much, many visits to the area. And I must tell you, he would sit down on his knee and with uh, uh, evacuees and give hugs to many of them. Uh, he touched their souls and their hearts, as did my friend Jim Zumwalt. Today, I am aware that Jim is going to share with us uh, his personal experience of extending U.S. help to the people in Japan. Uh, given his long history of dealing with Japan, which dates back to his teenage days, when he was an exchange student at the high school in Tokyo, he is, I believe, among the best places to give us both macro and micro pictures as to where the alliance stands and where the, the, it should head in the future. Again, both uh, mid-term and long-term. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Zimmer, please go there or? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for that very kind introduction. I'm really delighted to be here today, and I'm especially encouraged to see so many people, I know you're all very busy, uh, to see so many people who have come uh, to hear people talk about U.S.-Japan relations. It really encourages me to know that there's uh, so many people on this side of the um, Pacific who are interested in this very important topic. Um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about U.S.-Japan security relations, but also a little bit more broadly about U.S.-Japan relations. And I think it's really important as we talk about our security relationship to recognize the context or the framework of those relations. And what I mean by that is we really have a global partnership, at which security is a very important part of that. But the reason we are able to have this very strong relationship with Japan is because of our shared values and our shared interests. And as two democracies, two peoples who believe in the value of rule of law, human rights, uh, wanting to see a global economic prosperity, very naturally when we look at a problem we're facing, Japan often shares the same conclusions we do, and so it's very uh, natural for us to partner together and work together. And I think we have a tremendous uh, list of examples. Just to mention a few, you know, in Afghanistan, Japan has been very active working with us to try and uh, improve the, uh, the situation there. Japan's the second largest bilateral donor in Afghanistan. Uh, another very good example is uh, with North Korea, where we share an interest with Japan in seeing a uh, denuclearized Korean peninsula uh, and uh, wanting to hold North Korea to the commitments it made in the 2005 joint statement and the six-party talks. Um, another very good example just recently is Iran, where we're trying a policy of increasing pressure on Iran in order to bring Iran back to the table to talk about its nuclear program. And Japan is one of our partners in seeking to increase the pressure by applying some uh, multilateral sanctions. And we've been very happy with our discussions with, Iran, with Japan about Iran. Um, one other example is uh, counter piracy, where Japan as a maritime nation very much sees uh, the freedom of navigation in the sea as very important, as do we. And so it's very natural that we would work together. So these are just four examples, or many, many others, of how it's very natural for us to want to work with our partners in Japan as we address uh, issues around the world together. And so because of that sort of global partnership, of course, our security relationship is something that's very uh, important and something we um, want to uh, continue working to strengthen. Um, as you all know, uh, last fall, Secretary Clinton uh, wrote a very important article in Foreign Policy magazine talking about a renewed emphasis that we have on Asia. And in that uh, renewed emphasis on Asia, our security alliance with Japan is one of the most important aspects of that policy of renewing our engagement and sustaining our presence in Asia. And so we're you know, working with Japan now on, um, I guess I would call it maybe refreshing some of the foundations of our, our, our alliance relationship. Uh, we, um, uh, but just to give you a little bit of some of the facts and figures, just to show you how important the U.S.-Japan alliance is, you know, Japan is host to uh, 50,000 U.S. military personnel and approximately 50,000 U.S. military dependents, or 100,000 folks altogether. Um, Japan is host to the, uh, our 7th Fleet. Uh, the George Washington is the only uh, forward-deployed aircraft carrier that's uh, not home-ported in the United States. It's based in Yokosuka, just a, about 25 miles from Tokyo. Uh, the air wing for the carrier is based at Atsugi Air Force Base in, in uh near uh, in sort of suburban Yokohama. Uh, we have uh, fighter wings at Misawa and Kadena, um, Kadena and Okinawa and Misawa up in northern Japan. We've had the F-22 being deployed to Japan for joint exercises with the Japanese military. Um, the third uh, Marine Expeditionary Force is based in Okinawa, and that was a, a, a unit that's capable of deploying very quickly, as we saw during Operation Tomodachi, when many of the Marines were sent up to Tohoku to help Japan with the disaster response. Um, and the reason all of this is important is our forces in Japan have strategic flexibility. And what I mean by this is our U.S.-Japan security agreement, uh, each side is contributing something unique to the alliance. And on the U.S. side, we are contributing forces which could be used in the defense of Japan. That's a, that's a, a very large and important contribution. I think Japanese recognize the value of this. But Japan is also contributing something very important, and that is that Japan is furnishing facilities for U.S. forces to live, work, and train. Um, and those forces in Japan are not solely for defense of Japan, but also for assuring regional peace and stability. And so what this means is U.S. military forces 
based in Japan can be used for, uh, to respond to regional contingencies and therefore they serve a very big um, uh, deterrent value. So because of this dual nature of our alliance where it's, it's for defense of Japan but also for assuring regional peace and stability, it allows us a lot of flexibility in how we use these forces and that's something that's very important for us. Um, in addition to furnishing facilities, by the way, it's not just providing land, but Japan actually pays for much of the cost of stationing U.S. forces there. Um, our host nation support agreement, based on that, uh, Japan pays virtually all of the salaries of nearly 25,000 Japanese civilian workers on our bases. And these workers fulfill very important functions, allowing our military to focus on their mission. Japan also pays for the um, a large uh, majority of the costs of the utilities of our forces in Japan. And finally, Japan, uh, through its uh, fiscal improvement program, pays for a lot of the maintenance of uh, buildings in, on our bases as well. So this um, allows us to do a lot more with our alliance within our budget constraints because Japan is contributing so much uh, to the maintenance of our, um, of our alliance. So um, the other thing I'd like to mention about our alliance, of course, is the very important role of the self-defense forces in Japan. Japan has a very capable military, and we enjoy a very strong partnership with them. Over decades, we have done a lot to uh, work together, uh, exercise together, so that we can uh, be prepared for contingencies. And again, I think um, after March 11, when there was a decision that um, uh, for the United States military to be supporting the Japanese self-defense forces in their efforts to provide um, emergency response in the region. The reason the militaries were able to work together so carefully and so uh, well was because of all of the years and years of exercising and cross-training and personnel exchanges. So they were very good, actually, at working together in a very integrated fashion with uh, the Japanese military. I visited Camp Sendai, which was the forward uh, base for the ground self-defense forces and the U.S. military providing uh, logistical support. It was a very impressive uh, operation and uh, the thing that impressed me the most was the degree of integration of our two militaries. We had a command center with all these computers set up where people were identifying needs and then instructing who was going to be re responding to what needs. And it was a very much a very integrated operation. You had a, a U.S cell where they were providing information back to the U.S. forces about what, what they needed to do, but they were in the room right next door to the Japanese uh, command center, and every day, over a very hour, they were meeting and talking and discussing things, but they also had a common picture because the maps and information on their computers were exactly the same, uh, you know, the Japanese and, and U.S. forces. So it was very um, smooth uh, for the U.S. forces to provide the support to the Japanese self-defense forces during Operation Tomodachi. Um, as an American, I was very impressed by a lot of our personnel who were up there. We had over 24,000 U.S. military personnel um, and 189 aircraft, 24 uh, ships providing support in Operation Tomodachi. But talking to a lot of the individual soldiers and sailors and Marines who were there, um, that, that's what really impressed me the most. And when I would talk to many of them, often I would start my conference, because they're working really hard, it's cold, uh, many of them are sleeping outside in tents, you know, very trying conditions. Uh, in fact, our Marine uh, attaché uh, at the embassy was up at Camp Sendai for four weeks, and you know, working very hard. When I talked to him later, um, he had been in Iraq um, in, in 2006, and he said uh, what he experienced in Sendai was worse than Fallujah uh, in terms of the psychological challenge of, of all the things they were doing. So it's a very tough thing, both for U.S. and Japanese forces. But talking to a lot of the Americans uh, about what they were doing, um, many of them said, it's an honor to be here. Uh, but many others of them said, you know, we live in Japan, these are our neighbors, it's very natural for us to want to help them. And so I think um, that one value of our alliance is because U.S. forces are based in Japan, and they live there, and they have Japanese friends, and they like Japan, obviously that provides a tremendous a willingness to do their job, which is defending Japan should the need arise, because they very much are invested in this relationship. So I think that's a, a sort of an intangible benefit of having such a large forward deployed presence um, in Japan. Um, the other um, uh, thing that I just want to mention about the self-defense forces is, you know, we're very pleased to have the self-defense forces as our partner because of the strength of, um, of you know, uh, the Japanese self-defense force. Japan is a very capable navy, very capable air force. We do a lot of joint exercising, and I think our 
uh, becoming more and more prepared to re meet various uh, regional contingencies. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, since I think people are very curious about some of the things we're doing. You know, last month we announced a new approach toward our laydown in Okinawa. So I just want to explain a little bit what we're trying to do there. Um, I do have to say that we're right now engaged in talks with the Japanese, and so I, can't, I don't want to go into details about what we're discussing uh, with the governments until we have an agreement, and we're hoping to have something fairly soon that we can announce. But I do want to talk about our objectives and what we're trying to achieve there. Um, in 2006, when we announced our realignment initiatives and our Guam International Agreement, uh, we had two objectives, and those remain the same. Uh, first is for a stronger alliance, and second is for a more sustainable alliance. And I do believe that the various uh, realignment uh, initiatives that we have um, will result in a much stronger alliance, will be more integrated, uh, more interoperable, able to work together in responding to regional contingencies and to threats uh, Japan faces. Um, but the sustainable piece, what we mean by that is both Japan and the United States are democracies, and ultimately, without support of the people, the alliance cannot be sustainable. So we need to be pay attention to public opinion and to be responsive to public opinion. And of course, um, virtually about half of our forces are based in Okinawa, and so opinion in Okinawa also is very important to us. And we very much recognize that the desire of the Okinawan people to see a lighter impact of the US military presence in Okinawa. So our objective of reducing the impact of our presence in Okinawa is the ultimate goal is so that we can have a sustainable alliance by retaining public support for our presence there. So we have a series of initiatives we're uh, trying to, to do there, but essentially the end state would be reducing our Marine Corps presence in Okinawa from about, about 18,000 Marines to about 10,000, or about a 40% reduction, moving those Marines to other places in the theater so they are still able to, to provide the deterrence and to be there in case, of, uh, in case they're needed, but moving them off of Okinawa. And then the second big aspect of our agreement is to move the Fatenma, uh, which is the um, uh, rotary wing uh, part of the Marine Corps Air Wing, to the northern part of the island of Okinawa. Um, if you're familiar with Okinawan geography, it's a very long, narrow island, and the southern third has over 80% of the population. And so the idea is to move U.S. bases away from the southern third of that island, either off of island to places like Guam or other places in the Pacific, or to the northern part of the island where there's less population and therefore there's less of an impact of our presence. And in 2006, we announced all of this as a package, that we're going to move on all of these things simultaneously. And what we realized that uh, because the move of the, carry, of the um, rotary wing um, no, to the northern part of the island, to Camp Schwab, away from Futema, was going to take longer than either government had imagined, we didn't want to hold up the other good aspects of our agreement, which is moving the 8,000 Marines off of Okinawa to other places. And so what we announced last month, we called it delinking these two areas, that we're going to proceed with plans to move our uh, Marine Corps air wing to the north part of the island, but that's going to take longer than we had imagined. So we are going to go ahead and proceed with other aspects of our realignment initiative in Okinawa so the Okinawan people can see the benefits of the efforts we're making. Um, so now we're working with Japan on all the details, and I don't want to get into those details, but in a big picture, that's what we're trying to achieve. And I certainly think that the um, efforts we made were, um, or the announcement we had was well received in Okinawa. I think people welcome um, the movement of Marines off the island. Um, the other thing that they're very eager, of course, is once we're able to move a lot of our Marine Corps presence to Guam and other places in the Pacific, we'll be able to return uh, base lands, which are in very populated areas and I think have a lot of uh, attractive development um, opportunities. Um, if I could just briefly mention two other aspects of our relationship, because they relate to security. One is our economic relationship, and I'm very um, excited to be working on U.S.-Japan relations right now because I think we have a very bright future. Um, you know, our, uh, we have a very vibrant trading and investment relationship. We very much welcome Japanese foreign direct investment into the United States, which has had a big stimulus on our economy. There's a lot of good examples of industrial collaboration where U.S. and Japanese companies are working together to reduce the risks, to develop new technologies, and, and work together. Um, I was talking to one major U.S. firm, a big investor in Japan, to the CEO of that firm, and he said, 
Um, his company strategy, the reason his company is investing in Japan is such a, in such a big way is not so much for the markets, although Japan is a very large market with wealthy consumers and so it's very appealing, but he said the number one goal his company has is access to technology. And what he said was if we're not here with tie-ins with Japanese universities talking to the best and brightest uh, Japanese engineers, our competitors are here and they're going to be having access to these technologies, so we need to be here to stay in touch with uh, the, what the Japanese are thinking and doing so that our company has access to this kind of technology working with Japanese partners So because we, we're a global company. And I thought that was a very interesting strategy, but I think a lot of American companies see Japan as a very attractive place because of the human resources that uh, Japan has. That American companies want to hire Japanese engineers and Japanese scientists and, and collaborate and work with Japanese companies so they can partner and, and develop some of these emerging technologies. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, and this goes back to um, Ambassador Yachi's introduction, is the importance of people-to-people -people ties and people-to-people -people exchanges. As Ambassador Yachi mentioned, I went to Japan first as a high school exchange student back in 1973. And very frankly, when I signed up for an exchange program, I didn't even want to go to Japan. I was, in, I was studying German and was interested in going to Europe as an exchange student. And this program told me you have a host family and a school in Japan. So I went there and it really changed my life. But without programs like this, um, I think, I, I really see these kind of programs as investments in our future. You know, in 20 or 30 years, people who are currently high school and college students are going to be the decision makers on both sides. And so we need these programs and providing young people opportunities to learn about each other so that 20 or 30 years down the road, we have leaders who are making decisions, understanding each other and supporting this kind of partnership. So I know a lot of you are involved in various kinds of um, Nonprofits and non-governmental organizations doing these uh, and supporting these kind of exchange programs, and these are very, very important. And it's one of the really good things we can do to support the future of our relationship is to continue to support these kind of exchange programs. So I was very pleased to see um, the Japanese government announcing its Kizuna project, where they're going to be bringing a thousand Japanese students to um, the United States and sending a thousand Americans to Japan on these high school short-term exchange programs. This is very wonderful. There are many, many other examples of these kind of things, but I encourage you to continue supporting these kind of exchange programs. So in sum, I'm very optimistic. You know, yes, we have a lot of challenges, but we've always had challenges, and I think, uh, I think we're up to the task of managing these things, but I'm looking forward to uh, hearing my uh, partners on the panel and then to engaging uh, with you in some question and answers. So thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunbar. Now, the, let me introduce uh, Dr. J.D. Crouch. I would like to tell you all that he deserves a medal. Shortly after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant uh, experience, the multiple troubles, uh, his company, Kinetic, uh, I, I hope I can be right in uh, pronouncing his company name, Kinetic uh, North America, uh, under his own initiative, decided to send its cutting-edge robots and unmanned vehicles to Japan to work inside the plant where the radiation level was so forbiddingly high that no human could remain for even a minute. Uh, it may have taken some time for Japan to share its sense of pride or the need to save face to accept his most generous offer, but eventually the machine hit the road for Japan in mid-April after his robotic support team had completed operator training in Japan for Tokyo Electric Power Company, Tepco. He charged no money for the whole venture I'm sure he's going to touch on his own thought during the process. Uh, apart from that, he has much more to share with us based on his experience as Deputy National Security Advisor at the George W. Bush White House. Among the best, based on how U.S. defense policy has evolved vis-a-vis -vis the Pacific and the beyond, J.D., I believe, is more qualified than anybody in reviewing the evolution of U.S. strategy in a broader perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Dr. 
ゆでクラブチーム。Well, thank you very much,、uh, Natsan, and that was a very nice introduction. I'm I, I want to begin by, by, by giving everybody a little bit of a warning,、uh, which is that, that I'm not a Japan expert.、Uh, but fortunately,、uh, the wisdom of, my, of the moderator here, you, I have been flanked by two Japan experts uh, who, uh, who I know, know the details of, of,、uh, uh, of our、uh, alliance relationships and things much, much more deeply than I do.、Um, Uh, in particular, Jim, of course, is, is, has certain advantages over me in that he is in the day to day fray of, of the,、uh, the, the issues that are facing the US Japan relationship and, and, and,、uh, and more broadly、uh, our alliance uh, 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 posture in Asia.、Uh, but、uh, I have an advantage, which is that.、Um, I don't have to uh, uh, advocate or speak on behalf of the US government or, or anything. So I can, I, I'm in the, in the uh, uh, I guess, enviable position of being able to say what I think. Uh, and, I, and I will try to do that、uh, this morning. What I'd really like to focus on uh, is uh, how I see American interests tied to this region and, in particular, tied to our alliance with Japan.、Uh, Asia is a long way away、uh, from Washington, and it, and it is difficult、uh, sometimes, particularly for Americans, to connect how their interests, how their security are connected to the region.、Uh, and officialdom, of course, has recognized that importance for a long time, certainly since, since the Second World War, or even before that, maybe since. The beginning of, of uh, the, uh, the 20th century. But I believe that、uh, our interests are very inex- inextricably tied to the region, and I want to talk a little bit about that.、Uh, and then I want to close by talking a little bit about the, the alliance relationship and what I think some of the things we might be able to do together,、uh, or, or expanding on things that we're doing together now, maybe is a better way to, a better way to put it.、Um, Before I do that, I, I just want to make a, a, a remark about something that, that happened this week. It was about a year ago, obviously, that I was in Japan with uh, uh, supporting our, our robotics team、uh, that was going into,、uh, eventually into, into Fukushima.、Uh, and、uh, a couple nights ago, I was invited by、uh, the Japanese ambassador to a, a very large reception that was given.、Uh, uh, Basically, a, a kind of a memorial and, and, and thank you and reception for those Americans who had supported、uh, what was、uh, the, the relief effort. And, and, and I was taken, there's a, a tremendous video that was, that was done by, I think it was done by the, the、uh, Japanese Chamber of Commerce in, in New York, but I'm not sure, that, that showed、uh, two things that I think are, are really worth commenting on. One, one was the, the、uh, Absolute、uh, spirit of the Japanese people in rebounding from this incredible disaster, which is you know, bad. And I lived through, as the president's advisor, I lived through Katrina, and I can tell you that was not much fun.、Um, and, and, and the people in the region, it was a devastated region, but the, you know, the,、uh, the, the, the triple disaster in, in,、uh, in Japan、uh, dwarfs, obviously, the, the, the impact of that. And the video was compelling, I think, in, in two ways. One, the ability of the Japanese people to come through and show the strength, the inner strength、uh, of, of them. And, and I, I think that's important as we think about who we need to rest our alliance relationships on in Asia. The strength of Japan is really important in that context.、Uh, but the second, Aspect of it was,、uh, I thought,、uh, that there were a lot of younger Japanese, older Japanese, others in the video saying, Thank you. Thank you for what the world did. Thank you for what the United States did. Thank you for what the US military did. And I think,、uh, I guess I would just encourage if there are any、uh, officials from the embassy in the audience or are there are any others who have any influences, I would encourage that that video gets spread widely in the United States. Uh, and frankly, globally, because it, 
it showed both the strength of, of the Japanese people and their uh, sincere, I believe, uh, uh, thanks for, for the support that they got. Um, so let me begin by just pointing out an obvious point, that the United States is not a power of Asia. We are a power in Asia. And that means that we have certain advantages and certain disadvantages as a result of that simple fact. Um, the advantages are we're actually not viewed with terrible suspicion in the region. I mean, clearly in, in Asia, there's always a, a concern about are the United, is the United States going to uh, be here when we need them? Uh, or is the United States going to be here too much <laughs> when, when we don't need them? Uh, and so there's always a balancing act that goes on there. But one of the, one of the foundation points, I think, of our involvement with, with partners and friends in Asia is that we are not, in fact, wrapped up in the historical issues uh, uh, to the degree that, that many of the other countries in the region are. We may not be viewed as a completely honest broker, but we certainly are, are, are a more honest broker in that respect. And you know, the fact that we have no territory in the region uh, 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 to speak of uh, is, a, is an important aspect of that as well. The flip side of it is that there's always concern about the reliability of the United States as a partner. Because if you are a large power of Asia, you, uh, uh, you are going to stay there. You are going to be there. You're going to have to deal with the problems. The United States has, even if it is not prudent, it certainly has a certain uh, uh, luxury of, of being able to be more or less involved in what is going on over there. I would say less involvement to its own peril, but we have demonstrated in the past our ability to misjudge the situation. Um, so why are we a power in Asia? Why is it in our interest as Americans to do that? And why ultimately do I think it's in, is it, is it in the interest of our partners for us to be there? Well, I think the, the principal arguments are really three. One is the United States uh, cannot and should not uh, live in a situation where you see a, 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 a single power dominating the region in Asia, a power that is inimical to our interests. Um, this is a, by the way, uh, while it may sound a little shocking, this is, is in fact a very long-held historical view. Uh, it certainly goes back well into the 20th century. Uh, it certainly was the, the fulcrum of our policy uh, during the Cold War, where there was concern about uh, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, and its, its uh, potential uh, influence in the region. And of course, it comes to the fore today not as a uh, not as anything that is, is inevitable, but as a problem or a challenge as we seek to manage the rise of China in the region, and the inevitable rise of China, but not necessarily inevitably in a way that is as conflictual to our interests. A second reason, it seems to me, is that Asia has the potential, uh, because of its historical uh, uh, situation, because of its resources uh, and the like, uh, to, to become unstable. And we have an interest in its stability. That interest extends beyond military interest to uh, uh, economic interests, uh, and, and in particular uh, to uh, our, I think, vision for a, a better world, uh, a world that is more organized loosely around uh, the kind of democratic institutions that we share uh, among uh, the Japanese people and the American people. And the third is, and tied to that, and all three of these are tied together, is really the notion that we have an opportunity to strengthen that democratic impulse in the region. I would say we have an obligation, but we certainly have an opportunity. I think it is in, in America's interest to do that. It is also um, hard 
Uh, it is also not something that will be a, a linear process. There will be setbacks. And it is not also something that we're, 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 we can, we as Americans can determine the outcome. Indeed, if the very determining of that outcome would be counterproductive in this case. There has to be uh, a, an Asian or, in, in fact, individual countries' paths along, along this. But in this, again, I think uh, I, I would point at all three of these areas, whether it's preventing the rise of a hegemon, promoting stability, or strengthening the democratic impulse, that our alliance with Japan is the critical linchpin in all three of those basic American interests. So what does that mean in terms of sort of more kind of concrete objectives? Well, we need to, we need to continue to promote uh, freedom and access through the region. Freedom of navigation is an extremely important, uh, uh, extremely important aspect of this part of the world. Uh, and, and of course, our naval forces play a role in that. But so do our allies' forces and our allies' capabilities. Uh, we need to be involved to make sure that we can't avoid disputes in the region. There are going to be disputes, but we can try to create an environment in which peaceful resolution of those disputes is the norm uh, and, is, and, is a, and, and becomes the, uh, 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 not only just a generally accepted practice, but one in which there are stronger institutions to help support its implementation. Um, we also want to make sure that there are no cataclysmic or permanent strategic shifts, I think, that are negative uh, for ourselves or for our allies in the region. And I say this because I really think, and I'm, I'm an optimist, I think that time is on our side in all of this, because I think that the, the world is, is on a trajectory that is moving countries more in this uh, uh, positive uh, democratic direction. Uh, it's just as as impatient Americans, we, we we don't you know things aren't moving fast enough for us. Or they're not moving uh, in the necessarily in the direction that we see. But we have to keep the subtle pressure up in this direction, and and I think uh, making sure that there isn't some permanent. Of course, nothing is permanent in international relations, but more permanent strategic setback we would, we would not want to see. And that could come from a number of, of places. And, and finally, I think we have an interest in seeing the constructive development of the resources in Asia. And, and uh, Jim talked about this in, in one aspect of it, which is one of the huge resources, maybe the hugest resource in Asia, is the human capital and, and the the, the, the technical expertise and that sort of thing. Americans have a lot to learn from this part of the world. We have a lot to share with this part of the world. But there are also other kinds of resources which could be uh, and, and have been uh, areas for conflict and contention among the states in the region, which don't necessarily have to be that way if we can find constructive and multilateral approaches to the development of those resources and, and, and the access to those resources. Um, we have to pay particular attention, I think, to managing, and I won't give a lot of detail here, but the, the potential flashpoints. And again, here is another area where the US-Japan alliance is, is critical uh, in the region. Uh, obviously, we have the situation in North Korea, which um, you know I think all of us are sanguine enough to know that despite the recent announcements by the North Korean regime, we expect that the traditional playbook will return, that, that there will be uh, a more uh, uh, serious conflict or contention, maybe it's a better word, over the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, and, and underlying all, all that, of course, is the, the very difficult, much more difficult prospect of what happens when that regime uh, collapses and how we deal with that as an alliance, as, as the United States, as Japan, uh, as partners in the region, and in concert to some degree with countries like China, which will have a big stake in that. 
And there are other places like that, whether it be the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and the like, where I think more constructive multilateral approaches can be brought to bear. And this is where I think one of the developments of recent years uh, uh, has been uh, very, very promising. And I think the Japanese have been uh, taking the lead to some degree in this. And that is the development of um, regional groupings and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and action-oriented uh, uh, relationships, whether it be in the U.S.-Australian-Japan context, the U.S. Uh, Japanese, Indian, U.S. context, uh, a lot of, I think, very positive development and, and, and uh, constructive activity is being generated. We don't have a NATO in Asia. We're not likely to have one. In fact, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think the most Asia hands would agree not only are we not likely to have it, we're, it probably isn't a good idea to try to construct one. But we do have powerful institutions there and ones that are Perhaps they're less formal and less structural than, than, than things like NATO, but which, uh, whether they be like ASEAN or even the more informal kind of trilateral groupings we're talking about, I think can advance a agenda uh, that promotes stability and, and uh, uh, creates a, 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 a more democratic impulse in the region. Let me close by talking a little bit about the Japan and U.S. alliance. I said earlier that it is the linchpin in the region. I think that's true. I also don't want to go over Jim's very important point that, that this is an alliance that is not just in the region, but that is global in nature. And I think Japan being more involved in other activities, whether they be uh, through support in Afghanistan, uh, uh, more uh, discussion through NATO channels and the like and, and other security issues. This is all to the benefit of the alliance and all to the benefit of uh, 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 global peace and security. Um, but they're the linchpin in the region because they're capable, uh, because of their, their geography, quite frankly and because of their, their willingness to be uh, on, uh, on, on the right side of history in the region. Those are, I think, compelling reasons for the United States to strengthen this relationship. Um, we've seen the Japanese Self-Defense Forces work, uh, uh, I think, fantastically in the context of the, the, uh, the uh, um, the earth, post earthquake and post tsunami situation. Um, I believe that 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 if there is a silver lining a year later that has emerged from this crisis, is that it has pointed the way for several areas of cooperation within the alliance context. And I say this, and I'd like to start with with the non the non military ones because I think in some ways they may be more important. Jim touched on the increasing economic ties. I won't delve uh, more deeply in it than that. I think, I think uh, not only is it foreign direct investment, and, and, but also uh, for a longer term agenda, putting a more solid trade agenda uh, out there, even if it takes some time to get there, is going to be an important thing. We need to find ways to intertwine uh, the American and Japanese economies uh, uh, to our mutual benefit. And I think there are ways to do that. Um, the, the access to technology that he mentioned is, a, is an inter a very interesting point that I'll return to in a second. Um, a second one I'd like to touch on is nuclear power. And this, of course, is a, is a bit of a neuralgic issue today. I, I commend to you a, a, nice, a good piece today by Mike Green and Mike Wallace in the, in the Wall Street Journal on this topic. Um, but I think the central point of that, and, and I, I have served on a, a panel that CSIS put together uh, after, the, uh, after the, uh, the, the crisis in Japan to talk about these issues, is that it's in the United States' interest, I believe, for Japan to continue to be in the nuclear game. Japan is not a nuclear weapons state and need not become one. That, quite frankly, is one of the benefits of the U.S.-Japan alliance. But at the same time, uh, Japan has an interest in nuclear power, in my view, that extends beyond the provision of energy. 
critical as that is. Uh, Japan was on track before to increase its energy dependence on nuclear energy from about 30 percent, electricity from about 30 percent to 50 percent. That obviously is, is not going to happen uh, anytime soon now. But the flip side of it, I think, would be very dangerous if Japan retreats from that. And it's also dangerous to the United States. We need Japan, the experts in Japan, uh, to be uh, uh, involved in the, in the nu nuclear technology business. It's a strategic component of our relationship. It is not just an energy component of our relationship. Uh, and we can discuss that more perhaps in the Q&A. I think it's also time to look at the potential for a U.S.-Japan defense treaty uh, arrangement similar to the one that the U.S. and the U.K. and the U.S. and Australia signed. Uh, this is a, different than a treaty that is a treaty of alliance. We have an alliance relationship. This helped to uh, basically unfetter the ability for our industries at the defense level to cooperate with one another. Uh, and it seems to me uh, there, there, there obviously will have to be some structural and institutional things that, that Japan would need to do to, to be able to, 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 to work with us in that context. But I think uh, uh, holding that out there as a potential is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a good one. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, our joint activities together. Uh, I think more can be done in that region. Again, Jim is, and I don't want to dwell on those, but I think, I think the, uh, the refashioning of our, of our footprint in the region is extremely important, and I, I, uh, I actually, uh, speak, speaking uh, now with my old uh, uh, Republican hat on, I, I, I think what the President has done uh, is it, absolutely the right thing in terms of moving, uh, moving the relationship, uh, delinking and, and moving the relationship forward. Uh, we needed to do that uh, because the stakes were so high. I used to have to uh, meet with my good friend, Mr. Yachisan. I, I, I loved meeting with him, but the first thing we always had to talk about was Futemna. And we both agreed at the end of talking about Futemna that we, it was the thing we least liked talking about, except maybe beef imports. <laughs> um, that may have been worse. But then we were able, after that, to talk about really important strategic issues that face the United States and Japan together, and that, of course, is where we need to be focused. Um, the last thing I'd just like to mention is I think um, we need to do much, more, much deeper joint crisis management planning. Um, there will be crises in Asia over the next 20 years. They will arise from a number of places. They will arise from the fact that, that there's a rise in China and that there are, there are changes going on in China that even the Chinese government can't manage uh, completely. They will arise from an unstable regime in North Korea. Uh, they will arise as a result of natural disasters and the like. Uh, and it is really important that the United States and Japan, I think, deepen their crisis management planning capabilities so that we can act together uh, in this region, in the region. So let me just close by saying I, too, am optimistic. I think uh, this is, uh, th there are obviously a lot of challenges, and, uh, you know, not, not the least of which is, is the, 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 the uh, structural political problems we have here in the U.S., and, and in Japan that we're all having to work through. But the fundamentals of the alliance are strong. And they're strong, in my view, because of the capability and the will of the Japanese and the American people, and the fact that our interests are so clearly engaged in the region and, and so clearly tied to the region uh, that I think we, we, we dare not take the next steps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Clark. And now, the last but not least, I am delighted to introduce uh, Mr. Tomohiko Taniguchi. He joined the Japan Ministry of Foreign Affairs in August 2005 after giving a 
uh, his successful journalistic career to assume the role of deputy press secretary. Uh, luck helped as we would soon have a new foreign minister, Paramaso, uh, who was an avid public speaker. Soon, Taniguchi and myself uh, found him uh, willing to become <coughs> our chief public relations officer, so to say, and to lay down the out uh, what our national interests are. I cannot remember how many speeches Foreign Minister also made while at the ministry, uh, but a uh, compilation of his speeches was later turned a book, rather thick book. Uh, and it was Taniguchi who wrote them all as an anchor writer in close cooperation with members of uh, various uh, departments. One of those speeches was made in order to announce that Japan would do its utmost to help build an arc of freedom and prosperity along the periphery of Eurasian continent. Uh, Mr. Taniguchi had published a paper from the German Marshall Fund of uh, the United States focusing on the aims and motives that drove us to announce that initiative. Now an academic, he is going to tell us of the tasks Japan should pursue to help strengthen the evolving strategy of the United States. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Yatcha. I've been extremely humbled by your most thoughtful introduction. The ARC concept was genuinely Mr. Yatcha's and no one else's. Uh, and uh, just a little bit about the exchange programs. Uh, myself, as an ex uh, Fulbrighter, uh, I have mentioned the deaths of uh, two young men from the United States, both Jets, uh, who lost their lives helping uh, save the lives of children in the tsunami stricken areas. So JET, which is one of the uh, best programs ever launched, I think by the Japanese foreign ministry, has lost um, two precious young, young Americans' lives. Um, now, let me just uh, briefly walk you through some of the developments that have um, uh, occurred since March 11 last year. Some positive, but some negative, and disappointment first. Negative consequences. Budgetary constraint as a result of uh, tackling these triple disasters has gotten even greater. And uh, this adds to the situation where defense budget for Japan has been declining continuously since GFI fiscal year 2002. And Japan is the only nation in the, re in the region that's continued to decrease, not increase, the amount of uh, defense budget. And this all is happening against such necessities as to make the bases and the airfields missile resistant, which is one of the greatest tasks that Japan is now faced with because of the increased missile uh, capacities that the Chinese have built. And to better prepare for the next generation of warfare, which is cyber warfare, and to hire more, especially for the Japanese Navy. Uh, the Japanese Navy is experiencing its uh, tremendous overstretch in uh, manpower uh, because it's got the shoulder of many uh, burdens to safeguard the safe passage of uh, uh, commercial vessels from the Arabian Sea through the Malacca Straits to the South and East China Seas. Uh, so these are urgent tasks, but you can't do it with a shrinking amount of budget. Negative consequences, consequence number two, a weakened economy which is obvious. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Crouch uh, touched on this a little bit, but uh, and James also touched on this a little bit. 54 nuclear reactors are all set to halt. Among the 54, there are only two nuclear reactors that are still in operation, but they are going to go through the regular safety checks, and it is very much likely that all 54 reactors are effectively going to put it into halt. So the electricity has got to get unreliable and more expensive, and it's uh, going to tax the Japanese industries tremendously. And obviously it's going to do, economically, business-wise speaking, to favor the Ch China to the detriment of Japan. And trade deficits, can you believe that, is taking root 
please have no shot and right here. <laughs> if this translates into current account deficit, chances are the Japanese budgetary debt is going to be unsustainable because um, you've got a shrinking base of uh, savings. So it matters uh, for the alliance management. As you see, a weakened economy, uh, or weakened Japan, uh, is going to play a lesser role than otherwise for the management of the alliance. Now, the third negative consequence is Okinawa. Appointment failures. What a shame. I'll read it this out. Nuclear allergy 2.0. And um, the special context behind this is people around NOTA administration were about to make a case before March 11 that Japan would need nuclear submarine fleet in order to check and balance the um, increased assets of uh, nuclear submarines for the PLAN in the situation circumstances when there's going to be something called sub-gap uh, emerging between the number of submarines the U.S. has and the number of the Chinese maybe uh, will have in the future. So it's also a tremendous shame that the Japanese people have been entrapped into this uh, tremendous sense of uh, anti-nuclear. And then some encouraging developments that do exist and I will uh, introduce big three encouraging developments and small but important three encouraging developments. First, big three. Number one, arms export ban finally and largely loosened so that there's going to be a better cooperation and collaboration between the U.S. and Japan, obviously, but not only between the U.S. and Japan, but also between Australia and Japan and quite likely Australia, uh, sorry, India and Japan and so on. Two, F-35 chosen, the interoperability between the two um, militaries is going to be thus sustained. Number three, Japan is not seeking to enter the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. Now, a small but important encouraging development, number one, India has gotten ever more important, both bilaterally and trilaterally. Trilaterally, the first official trilat meeting among India, Japan, and the United States was officially launched in December last year. And I can tell you all the participants, including American, Indian, Japanese, uh, came out very much satisfied um, by being enlightened by one another, each other. And so uh, it's already said that the next, around, next meeting uh, the trilat is going to take place this time in Tokyo. Uh, and um, Andaman Nicobar, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this importance, the importance of these islands that India possesses. These islands are faced with, directly faced with, exit or entrance, whatever you call it, the Straits of Malacca, which uh, makes India a full, <coughs> integral part of Southeast Asian nations. And by jointly working with the Indians, the Japanese, or the Americans, or the Australians could better manage the uh, navigation route, the freedom of uh, navigation. Number two, there's been a shift in Japan's space development policy to help support U.S. GPSs <coughs> by launching something called quasi-Zenith satellites. And number three, a seed was sown for future Australia, Japan, US joint operations. I will touch on this briefly later. But here again, uh, I must draw your attention to some of the islands under the possession of the Australians. There are islands called Cocos and Christmas. They're all uh, both in, the, in what the Indians call IOR, the Indian Ocean region. And that will make also Australia's uh, status position very much strategically important for the joint uh, uh, operations. 
uh, whatever operations yeah, between the, the U.S. and Japan, among Australia, Japan, or uh, India, Australia, Japan, or the United States. Um, in fact, this is a direct quotation of um, Stephen Smith, Minister of Defense, Australia's Minister of Defense, uh, when he attended the 10th IISS Asia Security Summit, otherwise known as the Shangri-La Dialogue, he said, quote, at one stage during the relief operation, Australia had three C-17 aircraft in Japan, providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief support. Australian C-17 strategic lift aircraft worked closely with the United States Forces Japan Air Operations Command in providing this humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. This was a historic first and a very practical demonstration of Australia, Japan, United States trilateral strategic cooperation. And uh, to explain some of these positive encouraging factors, I have, I have to mention something called Noda factor, which is about the current prime minister. He's a proud son of a power trooper. And arguably, I would say, he is the best cheerleader the SDFs have ever had. And he is determined to activate collective self-defense. This is what I have heard directly from Prime Minister Noda. He has said many times about this to his close friends and associates. But in order for him to do this, uh, he wants to do that only after tax and welfare reforms you know, the increase of uh, the consumption tax rate and the reduction of the welfare provision. You know, each one of those tasks can take a cabinet or two or three, but Mr. Noda wants to do it under, on his watch. And uh, someone like Aki Nagashima are also uh, working, I think at present, uh, to push him to send mine sweepers uh, to Persian Gulf region. Um, I'm not sure what sort of legislative arrangement will be in, a, in addition needed for this to happen, but uh, that's the notion I guess uh, Mr. Mr. Nagashima is working with. To-do list for Tokyo, what should Tokyo do? I think uh, the Japanese government should tell the nation and the world who Japan is, what it stands for, and why it can be counted upon in a more articulate fashion. It's not dissimilar to a branding exercise, and it's um, the art concept that Mr. Yachi mentioned a little bit was also, in a broadest sense of the word, part of the branding exercise for a democratic and uh, uh, a democratic Japan that cares very much about the universal values. In the pivot context, I know that uh, this word pivot is being uh, used less and less frequently these days, but nonetheless, in the pivot context, uh, Japan must articulate on the ever-growing value of Okinawa and solve the issue. And it's got to deepen ties with uh, democratic peers in and out of the region, possibly and hopefully including NATO member nations. And for Washington, I would argue some sort of dream-sharing initiatives uh, would be desirable to avoid midlife crisis. Uh, it's, it's also a joint branding exercise. And more elaboration on something called JOAC, Joint Operational Access Concept, which is pretty much a brand new doctrine for the US military. The umbrella, I think, uh, concept uh, that includes air sea battle concept. Uh, those concepts should be uh, elaborated uh, among the experts on both sides. And this one, uh, insular territories, by which I mean Marshall Islands and those uh, small islands that the United States historically has had uh, good and deep relations with. And some of those islands have become and will likely be in the next five, ten years, uh, virtually Chinese dominion. One of them, Yap Island, is going to host. It's, it's a small island. Uh, for those of you who know um, how large uh, Awajishima in the Setonaika is, it's smaller than that. But nonetheless, the Yap Island is going to host uh, 
15 golf courses, 10 hotels with 4,000 rooms, with a first-class airport, with a direct connection, air flight uh, with the Chinese, developed solely by a single individual who created a five-star hotel with the Intercontinental Group at Lhasa, Tibet. Uh, so that, such is the thing that's uh, going on. And Yap Island, I don't think by coincidence, sits right on the second island chain, if you recall. So there is a strategic implication behind all of this. And um, I have just found those Marshall Islands have been looked after. Uh, you know, the United States is sending a lot of money, taxpayers' money, to these islands, but it's been looked after, not by the State Department, but, the, but by the insular, depart, insular office of the State, of the Interior Department, not State, but the Interior de Department. So uh, it's going to be better for the U.S. administration to change the jurisdiction from the interior to the state. Now, long term, uh, John Maynard Keynes famously said, we're, not, we're all going to be, uh, we're all going to die long term. But uh, long term, Taiwan's status is going to be ever more important. And Sea of Japan, I think is going to be a very much a crowded place, congested place, uh, because the Arctic navigation route is going to be developed in our lifetime. I think uh, President Putin, if he is successful, is going to build the two aircraft carrier uh, battle, battle force groups, and one of which is, I think, likely to be homeported in Vladivostok. PLAN uh, is determined, looks determined, <coughs> to go beyond the second island chain, effectively smothering Japan's strategic space. And Japan's resilience against the next big one, by which I mean the next big earthquake. Given the overstretching uh, Japanese budget situation, I think um, it's going to be a hard task for the Japanese government, and for the Japanese taxpayers to shoulder yet another heavy burden like this. And all this would be amongst the biggest worries. Before closing, let me say briefly, there was a shyness about military in the aftermath of March 11th, by which I mean the Japanese government did not explicitly praise the support came, that came from the members of the services of the United States. Therefore, a, a, a friend of mine, Yukio Tada, uh, many of you know who he is, and I launched a campaign to run Thank You U.S. Men and Women in Uniform ads that eventually found pages to appear on Washington Times, Stars and Stripes, and the uh, military paper's special commemorative issue. And this looks how uh, the ad was designed. And uh, uh, here are some of the names, including uh, Mr. Yachis, uh, and uh, names such as uh, uh, Democratic uh, Party of Japan politicians, as well as uh, LDP politicians, such as Taro Aso and his wife, and Shinzo Abe and his wife, and so on. And uh, this part reads, Thank you, America, for the prayers you are praying, for the songs you are singing, for all the paper cranes you are folding, and above all else, for the sweat and tears your servicemen and women are shedding to help Japan survive this disaster. You are our true friend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Taniguchi. Uh, from the three panels, I, I think, I'm sure that we got uh, really informative and insightful and interesting uh, discussion. And uh, I'll very frankly say that uh, this is an extremely uh, high level of intellectual uh, and uh, stimulating uh, discussion. At the same time, very heartwarming uh, presentation from uh, the three people. But unfortunately, time is running out. And uh, I'm wondering what I should do. If uh, there is any 
additional remarks or comments uh, from the panelists, uh, please uh, uh, take some time to make uh, additional. No? Okay. We have completed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now the, I'll take the, uh, two or three questions from the floor. Maybe I'll take the question all together and the, uh, divide the, uh, those questions to those three uh, excellent panelists. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. And uh, before making the uh, asking a question, could you tell the your name and so on? Uh, my name is Sam Letter. I'm with the Federation of Electric Power Companies of Japan. Uh, and I thank you, thank all the panelists for the uh, good presentations today. Uh, all three of you mentioned uh, in, in various aspects the, the situation with the nuclear reactors in Japan and the fact that they might all be shut down in the coming months and how that relates to the alliance. Um, my question specifically is in the area of nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, what do you foresee being the impacts if there's an extended uh, phase-out of nuclear power in Japan and how that relates to the, the U.S.-Japan alliance on efforts for nuclear non-proliferation? Thank you. I'm Abigail Friedman with the Asia Foundation, and again, thank you, uh, all three uh, very um, thought-provoking uh, presentations. One of the things that uh, the U.S. is focused on when we look at uh, Asia and internationally is what we call QDDR, the linkage between defense, diplomacy, and development. Uh, I would uh, welcome hearing from uh, the Japanese participants in particular um, how you see that third piece that wasn't really touched on today in terms of development in Asia. What are opportunities for U.S.-Japan cooperation to advance uh, the development component. I, my sense is that we do a lot now on uh, security, defense, we do a lot on diplomacy, um, but uh, I would love to hear a little more on uh, the Japanese vision of the um, development cooperation in Asia. Thank you. Yes. I'm Gil Rosman from Princeton University, and I have a question about uh, South Korea. It seemed to me the triangles that were discussed omitted South Korea, and that is probably the first priority has been for a long time in strengthening a consensus. And why has the public opinion in South Korea and the uh, president turned more critical of Japan in the last year? And if Japan is serious about uh, strengthening these ties, is it going to take on its own uh, lack of uh, energy in dealing with improving ties with South Korea in a lasting, uh, substantial way? Thank you. Yes, please. Ken Ryan from the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, working for Chairman Matsubo. Thank you for your presentations. I think, Professor Taniguchi, you hit on um, a point on joint uh, U.S.-Japan brand exercising. Um, here in Washington, I noticed, for example, in media, if one were to try to study Japanese, you'd have to uh, subscribe to a cable channel, pay $25 extra to see that, whereas if you were to study Chinese or Korean or even Vietnamese, you can readily find a number of channels. I can count five that you can access uh, easily. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not a specific example of where that kind of branding could occur would be in the role of, of, uh, of media. Thank you. Okay, the final question. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Warren Nagler. Um, I'm an advisor to some large Japanese corporations and a mega bank through my private equity firm. I'm also um, an a, uh, affiliate with Harvard University. Um, my questions, I guess, it, my questions really directed towards Mr. Zumwalt and Mr. Crouch talked about Mr. Zumwalt, and I also fellow Cal Berkeley alums, go Bears. Um, I think there's a bigger strategic issue related to uh, 
the future of Japan and security in the region. And when I look at, um, we were very involved in advising uh, one of the largest mega banks and its Canada 2 companies on the aftermath of, of March 11th. Um, and uh, number one, we see some very significant uh, environmental threats. A lot of talk is about radiation. There's actually a much more serious issue related to industrial accidents in Japan that is not being talked about. Um, so there are some grave uh, concerns for the future health of Japanese people. Second of all, there was a recent forecast of significant population dis decline and even further aging of the Japanese population. In response, the government policy is to increase taxation at the time where the burden of carrying both the government debt and the care for people is going to increase. China is becoming more aggressive in many ways. Because my question is, how do we get Japan to focus more on growth? How do you stimulate growth in this environment? And how are we aware and ready in the region for possibly a challenge of China to in some way gain undue influence over Japan in the next, let's say, 30 years? Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think I, I'll ask uh, Mr. Taniguchi to respond to the first question. And also, fourth question is uh, directly direct, uh, directed to address to Mr. Taniguchi, number one and number four. And about the uh, second question, that uh, development cooperation between the US and uh, Japan, in addition to the defense, uh, Mr. Zimo, is that okay for you? I'm happy to answer all okay. the questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, different okay. opinions as well. Uh, the fifth question is also addressed to you. So second and fourth. Uh, fifth. And uh, uh, Dr. Crouch, uh, also please join the, to answer to the fifth question, which is also addressed to you. And about the uh, third question, South Korea, maybe I should uh, respond. You, you can? Sure. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so start maybe uh, with uh, Mr. Taniguchi. Could you start with here? Yeah, yes, start? I completely forgot what the first question was, but... non-proliferation. Uh, <laughs> 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 Well, um, I think it's um, important for Japan to preserve its nuclear technology, which is a vital asset, uh, for Japan to claim leadership in this field, proliferation or otherwise. Um, so that's my general comment. And I think um, um, there's been a very positive development for the last decade or so, by which I mean the joint collaboration between some of the top-rate nuclear-related industries of this country and their counterparts uh, in Japan, Westinghouse and General Electrics and so on. Uh, they have tie-ups with uh, Japanese counterparts. And they, they can jointly build much, much safer reactors in the world, much safer, of course, than Fukushima Daiichi uh, in the developing world. And so that's what the Japanese and the US industries jointly can do. And that's all, that, that'll also definitely help uh, Provide, pr prohibit uh, proliferation from uh, spreading. Uh, that's number one. And I will uh, put the developmental question uh, with the uh, branding exercise question together. Because uh, in places like Afghanistan, there's still ample room for the United States and Japan uh, to provide um, you know, aid, uh, knowledge, uh, job skills, and so on. Uh, to the war-torn nation. And of, uh, of late, uh, Burma or Myanmar would be another case of case, case in point. In order for the fledgling, very fledgling, seemingly democratic nation to go really democratic, it is vitally important for both nations, the United States and Japan, to keep on providing generous support to that nation as well. So that's the kind of exercises you could imagine as part of the branding exercises as well, as, as torchbearer of uh, democracy, of uh, egalitarian development, if you like, that the United States and Japan can jointly do. Finally, about the, um, 
public relations exercises, it is true that uh, you could hear uh, Chinese, you could listen to and watch Chinese programs much, much more easily in the United States than you could watch uh, Japanese programs. And uh, this hotel uh, is uh, also a good example. If you enter the entrance here, the first newspapers that you will find uh, are China Daily. And I wish the Japanese government had that much amount of money without paying any attention to taxpayers or the journalism or whatever. <coughs> Yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of really good questions, so I'll try and be brief on each answer. Um, I think the first question was: Is there a relationship between nuclear power in Japan and Japan's support for non-proliferation? I would say no. I think non-proliferation. There's three aspects. Uh, one is promoting peaceful use of nuclear power. Uh, two is uh, making sure there's no expansion of nuclear weapon states, which is why we're so interested in developments in Iran and North Korea. And number three is rolling back. Uh, nuclear weapons, which is you know what President Obama talked about in his uh, speech in Prague, and, I, and Japan has been an extremely strong supporter of the global nuclear non-proliferation regime, and we count on Japan's continued support. And I think we'll have that because Japanese people are very interested in this issue. Um, I was at Hiroshima last August for the uh, commemorative ceremonies, and certainly got a very powerful sense of very strong public support for nuclear non-proliferation. So I think Japan will continue to be a strong power for us there. Um, on the QDDR, thanks to Abby, very good question. I think clearly development is one area, and I was remiss in not highlighting this, um, where J US and Japan can work together very well. Just, we do in, across the board, but just to give you one example, in Africa, the United States has a very strong AIDS program, and Japan has an incredibly strong infectious diseases program, particularly focused on malaria and other problems. And what we've realized on the ground is by working together, the US and Japan, uh, with the host nation health ministries, we can provide a more complete set of solutions to the health problems African nations face. So it's a very good example of how, uh, by working together, we can each leverage our strengths to be more effective. Um, on U.S. Uh, rock, uh, Japan triangular co collaboration, I agree completely. These are, it's very important. We very much want to enhance. We have a very good relationship with the Republic of Korea, a good relationship with Japan, but a triangle is much stronger than a hub and spokes, and so we very much would like to increase our uh, ability to work together. Um, frankly, the constraints are more political, and I think I would like to see the Japanese government trying to create a better atmosphere where there could be more progress in uh, Korea-Japan uh, security relations, because I think those that improvement is both in the interest of Korea and in Japan. The two big milestones we're looking for are for Japan and Korea to sign agreements that would allow for sharing of military information and also across uh, uh, to, to allow uh, procurement, so for example, refueling and those kind of things. But in the meantime, until those two things happen, we're very determined to work together. Perhaps our presence can help uh, maybe a triangle is easier to develop in a bilateral relationship. So you'll see, I think, more Korean and Japanese observing of our bilateral exercises. In other words, Korean observers looking at US-Japan exercises and vice versa. Also some trilateral cooperation in the area of uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, so I think you will start seeing more and more efforts, but frankly, I think there needs to be a better bilateral political climate to really have some more dramatic progress in that area. Um, concerning the uh, very good question on focus on growth, I agree completely that Japan faces some very severe demographic challenges, and therefore, um, looking long term, uh, economic growth is incredibly important to Japan. And if you have a declining population, the only way to grow the economy is to increase productivity per capita. And so Japan, um, I'm hoping very much, will look at these issues. One very important decision Japan faces is whether or not to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade negotiations. And while the era of Gaiats is over, we're not applying pressure on Japan to join. As a friend of Japan, I very much hope it will make it a pro-growth decision in considering this very important area of whether or not to join, I think, the most exciting uh, trade liberalization initiative in the region. Uh, just to comment on on non-proliferation, I don't uh, I don't dispute what uh, Jim said about uh, Japan continuing to be a reliable non-proliferation partner. But part of my comment about nuclear power being about more than energy, and I didn't have the time to get into it, is that we we of the nuclear energy states 
that have uh, technology are all having trouble right now sustaining our technological technological capability. We have not had a uh, earthquake uh, situation, tsunami situation like Japan, but the U.S. Uh, industry is far from robust. And we've lived in a world of non-proliferation norms that has largely been created by, by us. But we've been able to be forceful uh, uh, advocates for that world because we have led the world technologically in these areas. If we lose that technological edge, it will be ceded to countries like China, it will be ceded to countries like Russia, uh, and maybe even, <laughs> you know, maybe even countries uh, that, uh, that have more problematic backgrounds. And so my view is, is that we can't expect to continue to lead the non-proliferation uh, uh, endeavors if we ourselves are not leading on the technological front. And that, so that's what I was referring to. It's not that, that, that the uh, policies of Japan or the United States would change. But we would seek to have less. We would have less weight in in, in the world with respect to these things. So I think it's really important that we, we do that. Um, and I also think, by the way, that this is a potential area for U.S. Japan South Korea cooperation. Because to get to the third question, because uh, South Korea actually is uh, uh, has a, a more dynamic uh, nuclear industry right now and. And by working together to establish a set of norms and, and, and safety procedures and better technology and the like that we can uh, uh, spread safely to the world, we can, we can both strengthen our own trilateral cooperation and at the same time strengthen the non-proliferation uh, regime. Uh, I don't know whether you wanted me to comment on anything else. The only other thing I would say is that I'm a University of Southern California Trojan so I can't say go bear. <laughs> well, as a Cal Bear who worked for three years for a Stanford grad, I very much I appreciate your graciousness in your comments. I'm sorry, I forgot to answer um, the fourth question on branding. And I just wanted to make a comment there. I think, obviously, I think it's very important for the United States and Japan and our partnership to consider you know, what we're for and that message. But I, I think one thing we want to avoid doing is having our relationship be based on what we're against. And we're not an anti-China relationship, and we don't want to be um, talking about, uh, you know, because for example, I think having Chinese television accessible to Americans is a great thing. I don't think that's something we should be against. So I'd like to look at our brand as what we're for rather than what we're against. And what we're for is democracy, human rights, rule of law, uh, international development. And so let's, let's look at our brand in a positive way as what we're for rather than getting in this path of, of trying to be against things, because I think that's a very dangerous and, and not as nearly as compelling of an argument in terms of looking at our brand. Thank you very much. Is there any additional comment or response? No? OK, there are actually the, uh, we have run out completely. So I would like to conclude uh, this session. And uh, once again, uh, please give a uh, big hand to the excellent uh, three panelists. Thank you very much.